to Marius, the fever was like a cloud of warm river fog around him, or like the blissful vacuum that he'd always imagined death would be. He had lain for nearly a week like this in the big corner room while the typhoid raged and boiled inside him. Mary Ann was a dutiful wife. She came and fed him his medicine and stood at the foot of the brass bed when the doctor was there, clasping and unclasping her thin hands. And sometimes from between hot, heavy lids, Marius could glimpse her face, dimly pale and working slowly in prayer. Such a fool she was, a praying stupid fool that he had married five years ago. He could remember thinking that even in the deep, troubled delirium of the fever. "'You want me to die,' he said to her one morning when she came with his medicine. "'You want me to die, don't you?' "'Marius, don't say such a thing. Don't ever.' "'It's true, though,' he went on, hearing his voice miles above him at the edge of the quilt. "'You want me to die, but I'm not going to. I'm going to get well, Marianne. I'm not going to die. Aren't you disappointed?' "'No, no, it's not true. It's not.' "'Now,' Though he could not see her face through the hot blur of fever, he could hear her crying, sobbing and shaking with her fist pressed tight against her teeth. Such a fool. On the eighth morning, Marius woke full of strange fiery brilliance, as if all his flesh were glass, not yet cool from the furnace. He knew the fever was worse, close to its crisis, and yet it no longer had the quality of darkness and mists. Everything was sharp and clear. The red of his necktie hanging in the corner of the bureau mirror was aflame, and he could hear the minutest stirrings down in the kitchen. The breaking of the matchstick in Marianne's fingers as clear as pistol shots outside his bedroom window. It was a joy. Marius wondered for a moment if he might have died. But if it was death, it was certainly more pleasant than he'd ever imagined death would be. He could rise from the bed without any sense of weakness, and he could stretch his arms, and he could even walk out through the solid door into the upstairs hall. He thought it might be fun to tiptoe downstairs and give Marianne a fright, but when he was in the parlour he remembered suddenly that she would be unable to see him. Then when he heard her coming from the kitchen with his medicine he thought of an even better joke. With the speed of thought Marius was back in his body under the quilt again and Mary Ann was coming into the bedroom with her large eyes wide and worried. Marius, she whispered, leaning over him and stroking his hot forehead with her cold, thin fingers. Marius, are you better? He opened his eyes as if he'd been asleep. I see, he said, that you've moved the pianola over to the north end of the parlour. Mary Ann's eyes widened, and the glass of amber liquid rattled against the dish. Marius, she whispered, you haven't been out of bed. You'll kill yourself with a fever like... No, said Marius faintly, listening to his own voice as if it were in another room. I haven't been out of bed, Mary Ann. His eyelids flickered weakly up at her face, round and ghost-like, incredulous. She quickly set the tinkling glass of medicine on the little table. "'Then how?' she said. "'Marius, how could you know?' Marius smiled weakly up at her and closed his eyes, saying nothing, leaving the terrible question unanswered, leaving her to tremble and ponder over it for ever if need be. She was such a fool. It had begun that way and it had been so easy he wondered why he'd never discovered it before. Within a few hours the fever broke in great withers of sweat. By Wednesday, Marius was able to sit up in the chair by the window and watch the starlings hopping on the front lawn. By the end of the month he was back at work as editor of the Daily Argus. But even those who knew him least were able to detect in the manner of Marius Lindsay that he was a changed man and a worse one.
and those who knew him best wondered how so malignant a citizen, such a confirmed and studied misanthrope as Marius, could possibly change into anything worse than he was. Some said the typhoid always burned the temper from the toughest steel, and that Marius's mind had been left a dark and twisted thing. At prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, the wives used to watch Marius's young wife and wonder how she endured her cross. She was such a pretty thing. One afternoon in September, as he dozed on the bulging leather couch of his office, Marius decided to try it again. The secret he knew lay somewhere on the brink of sleep. If a man knew that, any man, he would know what Marius did. It wasn't more than a minute later that Marius knew that all he would have to do to leave his body was to get up from the couch. Presently he was standing there, staring down at his heavy middle-aged figure sunk deep into the cracked leather of the couch, the jowls of the face under the close-cropped moustache sagging deep in sleep, the heart above his heavy gold watch chain beating solidly in his breast. I'm not dead, he thought, delighted, but here is my soul, my damned immortal soul, standing looking at its body. It was simple as shedding a shoe. Marius smiled to himself, remembering his old partner, Charlie Cunningham, and how they used to spend long hours in the office, in this very room, arguing about death and atheism and the wither of the soul. If Charlie was still alive, Marius thought, I'd win from him a quart of the best Kentucky bourbon in the county. As it was, no one would ever know. He would keep his secret even from Marianne especially for Marianne, who would go to her grave with the superstitious belief that Marius had died for a moment, that for an instant fate had favoured her, that she'd been so close to happiness, to freedom from him forever. She would never know. Still, it would be fun to use as a trick, a practical joke to set fools like his wife at their wit's edge. If only he could move things, if only the flimsy substance of his soul could grasp a tumbler and send it shattering at Marianne's feet on the kitchen floor some morning, or tweak a copyboy's nose, or snatch a cigar from the teeth of Judge Robert Gantz as he strolled home some quiet evening from the fall session of the district court. Well, it was, after all, a matter of will, Marius decided. It was his own powerful and indomitable will that had made the trick possible in the first place. He walked to the edge of his desk and grasped at the letter opener on the dirty ancient blotter. His fingers were like wisps of fog that blew through a screen door. He tried again, willing it with all his power, grasping again and again at the small brass dagger, until at last it moved a fraction of an inch, a little more. On the next try, it lifted four inches in the air and hung for a second on its point before it dropped. Marius spent the rest of the afternoon practising until at last he could lift the letter opener in his fist, his fingers tight around the haft, the thumb pressing the coal blade so tightly and drive it through the blotter so deeply that it bit into the wood of the desk beneath. Marius giggled in spite of himself and hurried around the office picking things up like a pleased child. He lifted the tumbler off the dusty water cooler and stared laughing at it, hanging there in the middle of nothing. At that moment he heard the copy boy coming for the proofs of the morning editorials and Marius flitted quickly back into the cloak of his flesh. Nor was he a moment too soon. Just as he opened his eyes, the door opened and he heard the glass shatter on the floor. "'I'm going to take a nap before supper, Mary Ann, Marius said that evening, hanging his black hat carefully on the elkhorn hat rack. "'Very well,' said Mary Ann. He watched her young and happy figure disappearing into the gloom of the kitchen, and he smiled to himself again, thinking what a fool she was, his wife. He could scarcely wait to get to the Davenport and stretch out in the cool, dark parlour with his head on the beaded pillow. Now, thought Marius, now! 
and in a moment he had risen from his body and hurried out into the hallway, struggling to suppress the laughter that would tell her he was coming. He could already anticipate a wide-stricken face when the pepper-pot, pulled firmly from between her fingers, cut a clean figure eight in the air before it crashed against the ceiling. He heard a voice and was puzzled. "'You must go,' she was murmuring. "'You mustn't ever come here when he's home. "'I've told you that before, Jim. "'What would you do if he woke up and found you here?' Then Marius, as he rushed into the kitchen, saw her bending through the doorway into the dusk with a saucepan of greens clutched in her white knuckles. "'What would you do? You must go!' Marius rushed to her side, careful not to let either of them know he was there, listening, looking, flaming hatred growing slowly inside him. The man was young and dark and well-built and clean-looking. He leaned against the half-open screen door, holding Marianne's free hand between his own. His round, dark face bent to hers, and she smiled with a tenderness and passion that Marius had never seen before. "'I know,' the man said. "'I know all that. "'But I just can't stand it no more, Marianne. "'I just can't stand it thinking about him beating you up that time. "'He might do it again, Marianne. "'He might. "'He's worse, they say, since he had the fever. "'Crazy, I think. "'I've heard them say he's crazy.' "'Yes, yes, you must go away now, though.' She was whispering frantically, looking back over her shoulder through Maris's dark face. "'We'll have time to talk it all over again, Jim. I know. I'm going to leave him, but don't rush me into things, Jim. Don't make me do it till I'm clear with myself.' "'Why not now?' came the whisper. "'Why not tonight? We can take old Steamboat to Louisville, and you'll never have to put up with him again. You'll be shed of him forever, honey. Look, I've got two tickets for Louisville right here in my pocket on the Nancy B. Turner. My God, Marianne, don't make me suffer like this, lying abed nights dreaming about him coming at you with his cane and beating you, maybe killing you. The woman grew silent and her face softened as she watched the fireflies dart their zigzags of cold light under the glow trees along the street. She opened her mouth, closed it, and stood biting her lip. Then she reached up and pulled his face down to hers, seeking his mouth. "'All right,' she whispered then. "'All right, I'll do it. Now go quick.' "'Meet me at the wharf at nine, he said. "'Tell him you're going to a prayer meeting. "'He'll never suspect anything. "'Then we can be together without all this sneaking around. "'Oh, honey, if you ever knew how much I—' "'The words were smeared in her kiss "'as he pulled her down through the half-open door and held her. "'All right, all right,' she gasped. "'Now go, please!' "'And he walked away, his heels ringing boldly on the bricks.' lighting a cigarette, the match arching like a shooting star into the darkness of the shrubs. Marianne stood stiff for a moment in the shadow of the porch vines, her large eyes full of tears, and a saucepan of greens growing cold in her hands. Marius drew back to let her pass. He stood then and watched her for a moment before he hurried back into the parlour and lay down again within his flesh and bone in time to be called for supper. Captain Joe Alexander of the Nancy B. Turner was not curious that Marius should want a ticket for Louisville. He remembered years later that he'd thought nothing strange about it at the time. It was less than two months to the elections, and there was a big democratic convention there. Everyone had heard of Marius Lindsay, and the power he and his daily Argus held over the choices of the people. But Captain Alexander did remember thinking it strange that Murray should insist on seeing the passenger list of the Nancy B. that night, and that he should ask particularly after a man named Jim. Smith, Maris had said, but there was no Smith. There was a Jim, though, a furniture salesman from Wheeling, Jim O'Toole, who had reserved two staterooms, number three and number four. "'What do you think of the presidential chances this term, Mr. Lindsay?' 
Captain Alexander had said, and Marius had looked absent for a moment. The captain had never failed to recount that detail, and then said it would be Cleveland, and that the Republicans were done for ever. Captain Alexander had remembered that conversation and the manner of its delivery years later, and it had become part of the tale that rivermen told in wharf boats and Water Street saloons from Pittsburgh to Cairo, long after that night had woven itself into legend. Then Marius had asked for stateroom number five, and that had been part of the legend too, for it was next to the room that was to be occupied by Jim O'Toole, the furniture salesman from Wheeling. "'Say nothing,' said Marius, before he disappeared down the stairway from the captain's cabin. "'To anyone about my being aboard this boat tonight, my trip to Louisville is connected with the approaching election, and is, of necessity, confidential.' "'Certainly, sir,' said the captain, and he listened as Marius made his way awkwardly down the gilded staircase, lugging his small horsehair trunk under his arm. Presently the door to Maris's stateroom snapped shut, and the bolt fell too. At nine o'clock sharp, two rockaway buggies rattled down the brick pavement to Water Street and met at the wharf. A man jumped from one, and a woman from the other. "'You say he wasn't home when you left?' The man was whispering as he helped the woman down the rocky cobbles, the two copy bags tucked under his arms. "'No!' But it's all right, Marianne said. He always goes down to the office this time of night to help set up the morning edition. You reckon he suspects anything? The woman laughed a low, sad laugh. <laughs> he always suspects everybody, she said. Marius has the kind of mind that's always suspicious and the kind of life he leads. I guess he has to. But I don't think he knows about us tonight. I don't think he ever knew about us, ever. They hurried up the gangplank together. The water lapped and gurgled against the wharf, and off over the river lightning scratched the dark rim of mountains like the sudden flare of a kitchen match. I'm Jim O'Toole, Jim said to Captain Alexander, handing him the tickets. This is my wife. Marianne bit her lip and clutched the strap of her carpet bag till her knuckles showed through the flesh. She has the stateroom next to mine. Is everything in order? Right, sir, said Captain Alexander, wondering in what strange way the destinies of this furniture salesman and his wife were meshed with the life of Marius Lindsay. They tiptoed down the worn carpet of the narrow white hallway counting the numbers on the long, monotonous row of doors to either side. "'Good night, dear,' said Jim, glancing unhappily at the black porter, dozing on the split-bottomed chair under the swinging oil lamp by the door. "'Good night, Marianne. Tomorrow we'll be on our way. Tomorrow you'll be shed of Marius for ever.' Marius lay in his bunk, listening as the deep-throated whistle shook the quiet valley three times. Then he lay smiling and relaxed as the great drive shafts tensed and plunged once forward and backwards, gathering into the dark, heavy rhythm as the paddles bit the black water. The Nancy Beep Turner moved heavily away into the thick current and headed downstream for the Devil's Elbow and the open river. Marius was stiff. He had lain for nearly four hours waiting to hear the voices. Every sound had been as clear to him as the tick of his heavy watch in his vest pocket. He had heard the dry, rasping racket of the green frogs along the shore, and the low, occasional words of boys fishing in their skiffs down the shore under the willows. Then he stiffened as he heard Mary Ann's excited murmur suddenly just outside his stateroom door, and the voice of the man answering her, comforting her. Lightning flashed and flickered out again over the Ohio hills and lit the river for one clear moment. Marius saw all of his stateroom etched suddenly in silver from the open port hall. The mirror, 
washstand, bowl and pitcher, the horsehair trunk beside him and the floor. Thunder rumbled in the dark, and Marius smiled to himself, secure again in the secret darkness, thinking how easy would be, wondering why no one had thought of such a thing before. Except for the heavy pounding rhythm of the drive shafts and the chatter of the drinking glass against the wash bowl as the boat shuddered through the water, everything was still. The black porter dozed in his chair under the lantern by the stateroom door. Once Marius thought he heard the lovers' voices in the next room, but he knew then it was the laughter of the cooks down in the galley. Softly he rose and slipped past the sleeping porter, making his way for the white-painted handrail at the head of the stairway. Once Marius laughed aloud to himself as he realised there was no need to tiptoe with no earthly substance there to make a sound. He crept down the narrow stairway to the galley. The black cooks bent around the long wooden table eating their supper. Marius slid his long shadow along the wall towards the row of kitchen knives lying freshly washed and honed on the zinc table by the pump. For a moment he hovered over them, dallying with his finger in his mouth like a child before an assortment of equally tempting sweets, before he chose the longest of them all and the sharpest, a knife that would shear the ham clean from a hog with one quick upward sweep. There was, he realised suddenly, the problem of getting the knife past human eyes, even if he himself was invisible. The cooks laughed then at some joke one of them had made, and all of them bent forward, their heads in a dark circle of merriment over their plates. In that instant, Marius swept the knife soundlessly from the zinc table and darted into the gloomy companionway. The black porter was asleep still, and Marius laughed to himself to imagine the man's horror at seeing the butcher's knife, its razor's edge flashing bright in the dull light, inching itself along the wall. But it was a joke he could not afford. He bent at last and slipped the knife cautiously under the threadbare rug, under the little ventilation space beneath the stateroom door, and then rising so full of hate that he was half afraid he might shine forth in the darkness Marius passed through the door and picked the knife up quickly again in his hand. Off down the Ohio, the thunder throbbed again. Marius stepped carefully across the worn rug towards the sleeping body on the bunk. He felt so gay and light he almost laughed aloud. In a moment it would be over and there would be one full-throated cry and Mary Ann would come beating on the locked door and when she saw her lover. With an impatient gesture, Marius lifted the knife and felt quickly for the sleeping, pulsing throat. The flesh was warm and living under his fingers. He held it taut for one quick stroke. His arm flashed. It was done. Marius, fainting with excitement, leaned in the darkness to brace himself. His hand came to rest on the harsh, rough surface of the horsehair trunk. My God! screamed Marius. My God! And at his cry the laughing murmur in the galley grew still, and there was a sharp scrape of chair outside the stateroom door. The wrong room! screamed Marius. The wrong room! And he clawed with fingers of smoke at the jetting fountain of his own.